let me first uh, situate myself. I taught architectural history at a number of institutions in the US for over 20 years. And now I teach or organize the teaching of history, among other things, with a rather unique institute, the Bengal Institute for Architecture, Landscapes and Settlements in Dhaka. Bengal Institute hosts a design research laboratory and an academic program with a non-conventional approach and focus. It is not managed by university regulations on degree granting or streamlined by regulatory guidelines. And which is my first point, that the teaching of architectural history within the rigor of a university system can often be cumbersome. Let me pull up a few slides here now. The position of Bangladesh in a global architectural landscape is tenuous, no matter if Khan's assembly building graces the cover of Spiro Kostov's book. When I was a student of architecture in the early 1980s, my architecture school, enamored by a global historical repertoire, often disregarded the history of the region in which one belonged to and in which one would eventually practice. The course content was overwhelmed with Egypt, Renaissance or Mughal India and such, but little of Bengal. I now see this as the conflict between a world consciousness and a local consciousness. And this is my second point. World consciousness is perhaps generous sounding. It is more a matter of a pedagogical politics, if not hegemony. I'm reminded here of Milan Kundera's wonderful essay, Die Weltliteratur, from 2007. Although the essay is about literary and artistic production in a condition of what Kundera calls irreparable inequality, arising from being a citizen of what can be called a small nation in a regime of bigger nations and larger histories. I quote Kundera, for the small nations, existence is not a self-evident certainty, but always a question, a wager, a risk. They are on the defensive against history with a capital H. That force which is bigger than they, which does not take them into account, which does not even notice them." End quote. In such a context, Kundera wonders how to locate a work of art in the history of its nation, which he called the small context, or the supranational history of its art, the larger context. In my thinking, the formulation of an architectural history course is akin to Kundera's In uh, dealing with the architectural history of Bengal or Bangladesh, I have to deal with a number of issues in addition to the Kundarian precarity with history. There is also the question of the small scale. In comparison to the historical regional production of architecture, whether Mughal India or South India, the so-called monumental architecture of Bengal is of a moderate nature, which led the historian of Islamic art and architecture, Oleg Grabar, to comment that compared to other regions in the Islamic world, architecture in Bengal belongs to a smaller class. He saw it as an area, quote, clearly circumscribed in time and in space, end quote, from the Islamic epicenters. I would like to give a longer quote by Grabar because in a preface to a book on the history of mosques in Bengal, Grabar writes, 50 years ago or more, that is around the 1930s, very broad geographical categories, the Muslim West, Iran, the Indian subcontinent, were sufficient to categorize and classify a monument of Islamic art. Today, we cultivate dozens of separate traditions, at times reasonable geographical or historical entities, 
and at other times simply reflections of contemporary political divisions. The advantage of seeking to define such smaller units are obvious." End quote. So at the same time, Grabar is concerned. He says, the disadvantage is that the forest is no longer visible, only the trees. My own concern is whether my fidelity is to the forest or to the tree. Considering Bangladesh, there is also the fractured geographies of nationalist ideology. When India was partitioned in 1947, creating West and East Pakistan, the latter became Bangladesh. An arbitrary border cut through what was more or less a contiguous political and cultural entity of Bengal. This deeply impacts the telling of architectural history. What was ironic in the political border, what was, what was ironic is that the political border ran through the very middle of Gore, I'm showing here, an ancient capital of Bengal with a rich array of architectural monuments from the 14th century onwards, and even some older. A large group of monuments went to West Bengal in India and others to Bangladesh. And you can see here the border cuts right through the middle of the city. How then to narrate the architectural history of Bangladesh in this condition of fractured nations and divided ideologies? When I taught at the University of Hawaii from 2000 to 2014, I faced the dilemma of the small nation and the small scale in a similarly different form. In Hawaii, conversations on culture began and with how it is always in a fraught political relationship with the US mainland and the faraway land of European classics, shades of Kundera. In teaching designated courses on history in Hawaii, I also faced the dilemma of standardization and deviation in a more explicit and particular manner. At that time, my own historical cons concerns got left out. It was far more urgent to engage in the histories of the Pacific and Hawaiian islands. I would say in the process of engaging with Pacific histories, I learned a lot and I found a kinship between the distant Bengal and Hawaii. Uh, <clears throat> I've written about this particular image, Bangala Ragini, in the 1980s in the context of investigating an architectural paradigm of the Bengal Delta. I called it then the pavilion model what seemed a simple freestanding structure, even if used by a yogi, as you can see here, turns out to be an ecological and landscape model. This is an example how the singularity of an architecture is not possible. It develops in mutuality with the larger ecology. So in advance, let me say, and this is my final point, that architectural history is landscape history. I'm not currently working on a uh, collaborative project on the history of the Padma River. The Ganges is known as the Padma as it enters the plains of Bengal to create the Bengal Delta and then head for the seas. As you can see in the diagonal line cutting through the uh, map. There are many reasons why a history of the Padma is crucial at many levels, including architecture. We are arguing that the Ganges becomes the Padma at a point where there were three ancient capitals of Bengal. I already mentioned Gore. Gore was originally on the banks of the Ganges Padma. The Padma then heads southwest towards the estuary, where we have another ancient capital at Bikrampur. This is an historically crucial settlement. The Buddhist sage Atish Dipankar was born here and traveled by ship to Sumatra from there and was perhaps critical in the transmission of Buddhist teaching and culture to Southeast Asia, including architecture. In his travels in India in the 14th century, Ibn Battuta visited here and took a Chinese ship from, from here to, to travel towards East Asia. Short story, Bengal was deeply connected to a transoceanic trade network that connected China with India, the Middle East, and East Africa. There is this famous example, the Chinese mission of Cheng He in the 14th century, 
when they arrived in the Bengal capital, they witnessed a giraffe that was gifted to the Sultan of to the Sultan of Bengal from the ruler of Malindi in East Africa. Seeing the admiration of the Chinese team, the Sultan gifted the giraffe to the Emperor of China, which then becomes an iconic image in the history of art. Between Gore and Bikrampur is the history of Bengal and a deeper connection to East Asia. This is especially crucial in the context of Bengal, but this is totally missing in the formal architectural history courses. Anyone teaching the history of Cambodia, Java, or Myanmar, this is an extremely important link. This is what we'll be teaching at Bengal Institute in our next round. History of architecture and history of landscapes and regions. I'm more interested in how the two are implicated. And this reminds me of what Kenneth Frampton argued in the talk, uh, in his talk at the UIA conference in Beijing in 1999, that the architectural curricula be developed to include three important subsets, the history of landscape, technology, and industrial design. Thank you.